Welcome once again. In this session, we're going to read Hebrews chapter 12. Now, this chapter is packed full of really good stuff. One of the more significant points that it brings out here is about the great cloud of witnesses. So I'm going to read on in Hebrews. I'm going to comment as I go. And then at the end, we're going to be talking about the great cloud of witnesses and where they got that from. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, let's also, seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I know some churches talk about the crucifixion as if it's some very sorrowful thing. Oh, we need to we need to feel sorry for Jesus. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Remember when Jesus was on his way to get crucified and the people were mourning and crying and Jesus said, don't cry for me. Don't feel sorry for me, but feel sorry for yourselves and for your children. Verse 3, for consider him who has endured such contradiction of sinners against himself that you don't grow weary, fainting in your souls. You have not yet resisted to blood striving against sin. What a statement! And more than a statement, it is a challenge. You have forgotten the exhortation which reasons with you as with children. My son, don't take lightly the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and chastises every son whom he receives. And that is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. In other words, if you haven't received the discipline of the Lord, he doesn't love you. Verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with children. For what son is there whom the father doesn't discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have been made partakers, then you are illegitimate and not children. Furthermore, we had the fathers of our flesh to chasten us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days disciplined us as seemed good to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness." Think about that for a second. A lot of Christians think that we are partakers of his holiness just by faith, that we don't really have to show any so-called works. And quite honestly, as a side note, a lot of those Christians are just wearing the emperor's new clothes. If you're not familiar with the story, read it. But it says here that through discipline and chastisement, we become partakers of his holiness. Because it's through discipline and chastisement, we are afflicted and we become humble. The word humble in the Hebrew is actually very closely related to the word that means afflicted. And as we are afflicted, our pride gets beaten down. And as our pride gets beaten down, our sin gets beaten down. And as our sin gets beaten down, we shine as holy vessels of the Lord. Verse 11, all chastening seems for the present to be not joyous, but grievous. Yet afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. And that is found in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3. I love how the New Testament authors use the quote-unquote Old Testament to prove their doctrine. And make straight paths for your feet. And that is found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26. So what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Follow after peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no man will see the Lord. And as it says in other translations, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. We all need personal holiness. Looking carefully, lest there be any man who falls short of the grace of God. Stop there for a second. You can fall short of the grace of God by your lack of personal holiness. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and many be defiled by it. 
lest there be any sexually immoral person or profane person like Esau who sold his birthright for one meal. Some other translations use the word fornicator like Esau. How could Esau be a fornicator? Because most people think about fornication as just sexually immoral. But fornication goes beyond that. Fornication is idolatry, as it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Fornication is when you value some material thing, some fleshly thing, over and above God. Esau did that in valuing his meal over and above the blessings of God, his birthright. His birthright was the spiritual blessing of God. So he sold the spiritual blessing of God for some food. And you notice that in people's lives. Some people are slaves to fornication and to the flesh through sexual immorality. Other people through serving the God of their stomach. Verse 17, For you know that even when afterward he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for a change of mind, though he sought it diligently with tears. So in this translation, it says he found no place for a change of mind, even though he sought it diligently with tears. It's more accurately translated repentance or just simply change because repentance means change, not feeling sorry, not regret, not remorse, but change. See, a lot of people think that repentance means to feel sorry or to feel remorse or regret. Not at all. It says right here, Esau could not find repentance could not find that change even though he sought it with tears. You know, somebody might go forward in church and they might be crying their eyes out and everybody say, oh, look at that, look how much they're repenting. You don't know they've repented unless you've seen a change in their life. Esau could not get that change. Therefore, he could not get repentance even though he sought it with tears. Verse 18, For you have not come to a mountain that might be touched and that burned with fire, Now, this is referring to Mount Sinai back in the days of Moses and to blackness and darkness, storm, the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which they all experienced back in the days of Moses, which those who heard it begged that not one more word should be spoken to them, for they could not stand that which was commanded. And it says in Exodus chapter 19, verses 12 to 13, if even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So fearful was the appearance that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 19. But you have come to Mount Sion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable multitudes of angels, to the festal gathering and assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, referring to Jeremiah 31, 31, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. See that you don't refuse him who speaks, For if they didn't escape when they refused him who warned on the earth, how much more will we not escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven, whose voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And that is found in Haggai chapter 2 verse 6. This phrase, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that have been made, that those things which are not shaken may remain. Therefore, receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, let's have grace through which we serve God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That's a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. Remember when Nadab and Abihu, they were consumed by the fire of God because of the anger of God that burned against them. They were literally cremated alive. That is what it's talking about here. Now, if you saw my introduction to the book of Hebrews, you know that I said that this book is packed full of apocryphal and pseudepigraphal material. This is one of the reasons why I question whether this book was written by Paul, because it's so full of the apocrypha. And we don't see that much apocrypha in the other books of Paul. The theme here about personal holiness and about God's wrath 
We don't see much of that in other books of Paul. And yet again, in this chapter, we have a good dose of the pseudepigrapha slash apocrypha. I'm referring to the great cloud of witnesses. You see, at the time when this book was written, there was another book in circulation and revered as authentic scripture by even some of the early church fathers. And that is the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch tells us about the great cloud of witnesses. What you need to understand is this. The scriptures tell us very plainly that this whole entire age is like a courtroom. And at the end, we will be summoned to the courtroom of God. And in that courtroom of God, God is the ultimate authority. God is the ultimate judge. And in that courtroom, just like any other courtroom, there needs to be witnesses. God sent his angels and other spiritual beings, as it says here in Hebrews chapter 12, to be witnesses of what is going on here on earth. Remember in the book of Genesis where the people cried unto God against the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? What did God do? God sent angels to be witnesses. The angels came down, came to Lot's house, and they became witnesses of the evil that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And according to this chapter that we just read, these witnesses are angels, God himself, Jesus, and the spirits of just men made perfect. Some of the saints of old, some of the prophets and saints of old that have gone on before us. Spiritual beings who are watching, watching us. They are witnessing what's going on here on earth. They are witnessing what you are doing in your private space. They are witnessing what you are doing behind closed doors. They are watching. They are the watchers spoken of in the book of Enoch. So we know that the book of Enoch existed and was in circulation in the days of the author of the book of Hebrews, because we know the book of Enoch was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know that the teachings of the book of Enoch was referred to explicitly by Jude in the New Testament, and also by some of the early church fathers. Circumstantial evidence proves that the author of the book of Hebrews is talking about the watchers, the great cloud of witnesses, as per book of Enoch. Yes, the Apocrypha and lot of the Pseudepigrapha is all woven together in one with the scriptures that's commonly accepted today. You cannot fully understand or appreciate the meaning and the context of the Bible unless you fully understand the apocryphal books, the pseudepigraphal books. Until next time, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.